This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is June 5th, 2022. I'm producer Pat, and with me is Christina Roach. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry we've been away for a couple weeks. Darren was in Portugal, and a virus tried to eat my face. (laughs) (laughs) Funny, not funny. Yeah, it was dicey there for a bit, but uh, I'm fully recovered. Yes, and we're hoping to get back to uh, a foursome of shows soon. Maybe not every week because uh, everybody's schedules, but we really miss doing uh, shows with the guys live. So anyways, look forward to that. In the meantime, we have three interesting segments for you this week. Darren is going to give us his thoughts on the book Road to Unfreedom by Timothy Snyder. Adam gives us a segment about behavioral differences between dog breeds. But first, Christina, you're going to talk to us about the fascinating world of dishwashers? <laughs> Doesn't sound very fascinating, but I promise you you will find it a little bit fascinating, at least. As you may know if you listen to TRC, we effing love science. A little shout out to the folks at IFL Science, especially when it helps debunk an age-old debate. Okay, maybe not age-old, but definitely a hot topic in many households. Is dishwashing more eco-friendly and cost-efficient than hand-washing dishes? Pat, you have an opinion on this. I know the answer. (laughs) But before you knew the answer, you've always been a just put it in the dishwasher guy. Everything, 100%. Oh, here at Casa Roach, we put most dishes and cutlery in the dishwasher. We wash Tupperware, chef's knives, frying pans by hand. And Pat has maintained that using the dishwasher is ultimately more economic than washing dishes by hand. And I admittedly have been a little bit skeptical about this. I assumed current day dishwashers were way more cost efficient and eco friendly than the versions I grew up with, but it's hard to wrap my head around the volume of water I believe, or believed, spoiler alert, a dishwasher uses versus the amount of water in a sink. So, in an effort to satisfy our own curiosities, we did some digging, and what we learned is info I thought worth sharing with y'all. An article in The Grist titled Science dishes out, haha, an answer on the old hand-washing versus dishwasher debate, breaks down a recent study aimed at finding the most energy and water-efficient way to do the dishes. A 2020 study, which I link to in the show notes, of course, was published in the journal Environmental Research Communications and is called A Guide to Household Manual and Machine Dishwashing Through a Life Cycle Perspective. That almost sounds philosophical, doesn't it? (laughs) Okay, full disclosure. This study was partially funded by Whirlpool. Guess what Whirlpool makes? Mm -hmm. Appliances like dishwashers. The research was conducted in a Whirlpool lab where 38 Whirlpool employees were tasked to manually load a dishwasher and wash dishes by hand. The grist writer Zoya Turstein made an astute observation that Whirlpool employees probably have some dishwasher loading skills above and beyond the average person. That shouldn't really affect the, the results of this too much. It's just, it's just worth noting. So yes, study partially funded by Whirlpool. But the actual analysis of the data was completed by independent researchers at the University of Michigan, that's important, who also tested results from previous studies that concluded dishwashers were more efficient than washing dishes manually. The abstract states, this study evaluates and provides guidance on improving the life cycle environmental performance of dishwashing in the typical U.S. household. Typical user behaviors and recommended best practices for manual dishwashing, as well as machine dishwasher use, are evaluated. And the researchers found in the majority of cases, dishwashers, specifically newer models, are more efficient than hand washing. Celia Topping from OVO Energy, I wonder if Drake has anything to do with that, told Real Homes magazine, older appliances manufactured before 2000 used around 25 liters of water per cycle, while a more modern one would use 10 liters per cycle on an echo setting. It's a big difference caused by the newer machines reusing the water rather than constantly piping in fresh water. Things I learned today. Topping goes on to say, if you wash everything under a running tap, it's estimated that you could use up to nine times as much water as a dishwasher uses. The study I'll get into more shortly 
cites that dishwashers used around 16,300 gallons or 74 kiloliters of water over 10 years, while hand washing used 34,200 gallons or 155 kiloliters. So if you're someone like Pat who sits in the just put it in the dishwasher camp, you'll be happy to know that this adage is mostly correct. Simply put, a dishwasher uses way less water than you would use washing the same amount of dishes in the sink. Do you feel vindicated, Pat? I do, yes. <laughs> there are a couple of stipulations, specifically when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. The study illustrates a couple of main problems with dishwashers, which are pre-rinsing and heated drying, which are part of some dishwasher cycles. Using the echo modes or shorter cycles that avoid you know, both of these steps decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 3 and 11% respectively. Hand washing while leaving the water running to rinse the dishes emitted 5,620 kilograms of greenhouse gases over 10 years. For context, that's approximately 32 place settings per week. And this is mainly because of the energy to heat the water. Over the same time period, a dishwasher produced 2,090 kilograms, less than half. And here's an interesting quote from the article. A dishwasher that's being used correctly emits 63% fewer emissions in its entire life cycle, including manufacturing and disposal than a typical sink. Wow. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Are we going to get into a calculation between how much energy a dishwasher uses versus how much you have to consume in order to do a load of dishes? <laughs> Not today. No, okay. <laughs> Now, for those who have a dishwasher but habitually wash dishes by hand, because maybe you thought it was more energy efficient, not all is lost. If you have a sink with two basins, if you fill one basin with hot water where you soak and wash the dishes, and then you rinse them in the second basin filled with cool water and air dry the dishes, this was found to actually be the most energy efficient of all the methods tested by researchers. It only produced 1,610 kilograms or around 3,500 pounds of emissions over a 10 year period. An article in the Columbia Daily Tribune stresses what I've learned since deep diving into YouTube about how to get the most out of your dishwasher. We actually recently replaced ours, so unsurprisingly, I like to do a lot of research before a big ticket purchase like that. One notable thing I learned is that rinsing dishes before loading the dishwasher, counterintuitive. Modern dishwashers have sensors to detect how dirty dishes are and respond accordingly. A little rinsing or scraping off bits of food is cool, but Morgan Brashear, a Procter & Gamble Cascade scientist, which is a dishwashing detergent here in North America, he told Insider, if you pull a helicopter cleaner and you rinse all of your dishes except for one casserole dish with some baked on cheese or one morning bowl of stuck on oatmeal, nothing will come off in the pre-wash telling your dishwasher that there's no food present and it will run a shorter cycle, leading to a less thorough clean and potentially some cheese or oatmeal left on the dish. Hmm. You also need to load it up, people. The grist says 80% of people in the U.S. specifically reportedly own a dishwasher, yet only 20% use it less than once a week. Wow. I'd imagine if you live alone, it's tough to fill a dishwasher. I know my bestie, who's single, um, mentioned to me that it just makes more sense for her to wash a plate in the glass that she just used. So I get that. But it makes sense for the rest of us. We're wasting water if we're running half loads. And another tip while we're at it is run your dishwasher at night if you can, because that's after an energy company's peak hours and you'll, you'll save more money. So there you go. I know before I moved to Toronto, Christina, you and I were dating long distance. I was still back in Ottawa. And in my house, I had a very small dishwasher. Yeah. Um, and that's because I just didn't have enough dishes to fill, right. to fill one up. Yeah. So there's more than one kind of dishwasher to keep in mind too. Mm -hmm. All right, Christina, thank you. And with that, we will turn things over to Adam and Darren. Hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy. And we will talk to you again soon. Stay classy, not smart assy. What's up, cuboids? A new study has been making the rounds recently and suggests that contrary to common assumptions, dog personalities have little to do with their breed. So I first saw this and I thought, really though? 
So I'm not really a dog person, so I am open to the idea. But it seemed a bit uh, blank slate-ish, um, kind of the idea that it's all nurture and no nature. So I thought maybe I'd take a look at what the study was like, um, see if there are any weaknesses, and see what other research suggests to see if this is just sort of what people think or if there was good reasons for people to believe it. Now, we should use scientific evidence such as this to inform our views of reality, of course. But we should also accept new information as a way to adjust our prior beliefs while keeping in mind the reasons and the strengths of those prior beliefs. So do we really just think of dog breed personality differences for no good reason? Or is there a valid basis for having them in the first place? Maybe the actual behavior of dogs, for example. This study by Morrill et al. looked at DNA sequences of over 2,000 dog breeds and compared them to owner surveys to try to map genes to behaviors and physical traits. The authors claim that while many physical traits are associated with dog breeds, that behavior was more variable among individual dogs. So what this basically is saying is that the average differences between breeds is small compared to larger variances between individual members of the same dog breed. Now some traits uh, they say were more heritable by breed, the biggest one being biddability, not a word I'd ever heard of either, but this means how well dogs respond to human direction. So I don't know about you, but to me, this is kind of a big one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big behavior thing that you want to know about the dog breed you're looking to get. So it's sort of like saying, uh, you know, we studied humans. They didn't differ much except by this one metric, which is like how they do at school and work. You know, okay, maybe it's a big one. And I quote from the study, Thus, dog breed is generally a poor predictor of individual behavior and should not be used to inform decisions relating to selection of a pet dog. Well, that's a strong statement to me. An important thing to consider in this study is that it focuses on what it refers to as modern dog breeds, those originating less than 160 years ago, and that being about 1% of dog history, all considered. So the history of since uh, the first dogs were domesticated. So while dogs have been domesticated for over 10,000 years, that number may be quite a bit bigger. We've discussed this on other episodes. These dogs have been undergoing evolutionary pressures all of this time, but they wouldn't have been intentionally bred for certain physical purposes. So prior to the 1800s, this would be uh, before what is being called the modern breeds by the study's authors. And these were dogs which were selected for more functional roles, so things like hunting, guarding, and herding. Then the more recent uh, breeding, the last 160 years or so, um, they'd say that dogs were selected for aesthetic differences rather than functional ones. So really what they're teasing out here are behavioral differences for modern breeds, which they say were not bred for behavior, and they're not so much trying to tease out uh, between what occurred earlier in dog evolution. So what did the study show? Well, there are pure breeds and there are mutts and many dogs are mutts, which is a mix of various pure breeds. So they use genetic evidence to attempt to measure the behaviors of pure breeds and mutts, trying to determine what uh, pure breeds made up those mutts, right? So you can, you can kind of find things within what the pure breed does, then you should be able to estimate sort of how much that's mixed up within uh, those, those mutt dogs. So in pure breed dogs, personality and training needs varied between species roughly as much as between members of a species. So there's a lot of sort of noise or random variation here, but I don't think it's fair to say that this is a quote, poor predictor of individual behavior, but I suppose that's subjective. So yes, there are differences between breeds and there are also differences between individual members. Now, physical traits, unsurprisingly, were quite heritable with a factor of 85% heritability. So a large breed being large and a small breed being small means that there's usually not going to be a big overlap compared to the variation between those breeds, right? Like you're not going to have uh, a Chihuahua that's bigger than a St. Bernard unless they're really outliers of either. But basically, they say there's less heritability with the behavioral traits. So evidently, it's not going to be as pronounced as some of the physical traits. Some of the more heritable traits were retrieving. So that's 52.5% heritability, plus or minus 9.2%. And human sociability, 67.3%, plus or minus 13%. Human sociability, that seems like a big one. <laughs> Again, you, you want that uh, to be in the dog that you're getting. So breed does mean something scientifically. 
In the aggregate, we can see behavioral differences. The issue is that it has limited use for individual behavior. So the, off, the authors say it's unreliable. And since behavior varies a lot between individual dogs and a breed, you can't be sure what you're going to get with any particular dog. So you, you can't guarantee that your dog is going to have a certain behavioral trait when you uh, adopt them, uh, purchase them, whatever you might be doing. Now, they do give some specific numbers uh, to, to reference these, which is useful. In fact, there's even a calculator linked in the study. So you can choose a trait, and then it will give you the chances that you'll get that trait with a specific breed or mutt. So I put in high sociability, which, you know, that's a thing that someone might want in a family dog or any dog, really. Um, Golden Retriever has 62% the highest, and then it varied amongst other breeds, and the lowest was Dachshund at 22%. Um, my family had two uh, Dachshunds growing up, and I think these, these results might make a bit of sense. <laughs> so oddly, the study mentions this example and says that Golden Retrievers have a 40% rating, not the 52% rating that their calculator shows, um, and they correctly states the Dachshund has uh, 22%. I know the difference there is 40%, so there might have been some uh, error in uh, the way that was stated. So I, I happen to think that's a really, that's a really big difference. <laughs> so most, most of the breeds hovered around this 35 to 45% range, and that's not going to make a huge difference, not a big range in odds. Um, but there are some clear outliers here, and you'd have almost three times better odds of having a highly sociable golden retriever than if you adopted a Dachshund. I think that's worth considering. I, I don't think you can say it doesn't really matter what kind of breed you get. Is it unreliable because it's not perfect? It isn't perfectly reliable, but you have much better odds. I think that's useful. The study also looked at stereotype accuracy uh, and found that stereotypical behavior for many breeds did seem to match with reported behavior. So for example, a breed that's said to be high on ease of training was high on biddability, so that's responding to human direction, and toy directed, so breeds said to be low on energy level, uh, scored well on being more composed, more social, and less environmentally engaged, less kind of triggered by the environment, you might say. So are dogs just acting the way their owners expect them to act because they're internalizing the behavior somehow, training something? I would think no, um, but I can't be totally ruled out. The study says this is a major caveat. So the people running the study think this is more of a thing than I do. And if, if you think that's more of a thing that I do, that's fine. I just don't put a lot of weight in that. It sounds kind of like a, a blank slate type idea to me. That said, perhaps people see what they want to see and report on what they'd expect to see uh, in their dog's behavior, even if that behavior doesn't really fit with that. So, you know, confirmation bias and all sorts of things like that. You ignore certain uh, behavior that doesn't fit it and you um, emphasize the certain behaviors that do fit your expectations about that dog. So this seems to me like a more plausible reason for an alignment between the, the stereotype and the reported behavior, assuming that those stereotypes were not true it makes more sense to me than like the environment shaping the dog which doesn't you know that doesn't act like a person does and I'm not totally convinced that works as much as people think it does in humans even though I accept that it is probably a factor in the way people act. Now when we study mutts there's cases where the owners may not actually know which breeds make up their dog's behavior and we find that the behaviors related to breed stereotypes are less likely to be observed. Okay, so if you have a pure breed, you're more likely to identify the stereotyped behaviors uh, as being something that your dog is doing. So this suggests that the owners are reporting the stereotyped traits um, more often when they can identify it with the breed. So this kind of tells you that there's probably something going on with the reporting or the owner here or some potential influence. So to me, all of this really is suggesting that there's a difference in breeds, but as the discussion of the study states, breeds offer only modest value in predicting the behavior of individual dogs. Okay, it's a bit like saying if someone has smart or tall parents, we can't know for sure that their kids will be smart or tall, even we know that these things have a strong genetic basis, they correlate strongly within families. All right, so with anything, let's look at what the prior scientific consensus was. Um, if all breed stereotypes were just stories of owners that didn't often have more than, uh, you know, a few dogs in their lives, we could think they could have come up with inaccurate stereotype ideas or some of these could just be perpetuated as myths. So I found a 2019 study which states, 
genes play a role in dog breed differences in behavior. Okay, <laughs> that's that's a pretty strong statement there. So what I found a bit funny about this is that right off the bat in the sort of uh, flavor text which opens the study, they make a claim that looks at dogs very differently than the other study did. And I quote, People have bred dogs for their looks, but the lion's share of breeding efforts have taken aim at eliciting particular behaviors, according to the University of Pennsylvania's James E. Serple. If you look at the evolution of the dog, selection has been primarily for behaviors, hunting behaviors, guarding behaviors, or giving companionship to humans, he says. So while the other study mostly focused on physical traits being looked for in modern dog breeds, this one acknowledges the strong interest in breeding behaviors throughout the history of dogs, right? So we only have the small window of recent modern dog breeds that have been selecting for uh, physical traits. So both are right, um, just to different degrees, and they're just focusing on different aspects of dog, uh, dog evolution, basically. And this study was similar in many methods. So there was a survey given to over 50,000 dog owners and they used data from gene sequencing of dogs. And the results were that half of the variation measured across breeds were genetic. But then here's another quote. It's important to keep in mind that we looked at breed averages for behavior, says Snyder Mackler. We're not at a point yet where we can look at an individual's genome and predict behavior. Environment and training still has a very, very strong effect. So who's right? Well, I think they both are, and they're kind of saying the same things. Um, like the results seem to say the same things. The studies both seem to show that there were some trends within breeds. They both acknowledge that there is a huge portion of behavior which is influenced by environmental factors and that it's hard to make determinations about individual dogs. They just state it in a way which seems to give a drastically different idea. Like their takeaways are total different points, but they're kind of saying the same thing. So it's the old nature versus nurture thing. It's a silly debate since it's always a mix of both. In the case of dogs, like with people, the trick is understanding what makes up the nurture. So for people, there's this assumption that it's parenting, but that often has a small effect. People seem to sort of overestimate that parenting is, is the thing that's going to change how someone sort of grows up and has a personality. Now, the big influences are your culture, your peer groups, as well as uh, hard to control factors, illnesses, injuries, which affect a person's outlook. Um, genetics is about half, with environment being about half but just not necessarily the kind of environment that people think. So with dogs, it's a bit different as a human sort of controls a dog's total environment. A dog doesn't go off to school and hang around at the mall with other dogs. They're sort of always at home or with their owners. Maybe there's a bit of interaction with dogs. like at a dog park situation or something like that, but there's, there's not a ton of that. But again, it's, it's not about the way they're raised or trained, um, but hard to control factors, right? And you can have things like illness or injury, which if they took part early uh, in a dog's life, you know, as a puppy, that might be uh, something outside of the owner's control. Uh, again, there's probably something like half genes, half environment, which the environment is these kind of hard to control factors. Can dog breeds predict behavior? Well, contrary to the headlines discussing this study, I'm inclined to say yes, sort of. There's a ton of variation between individual dogs, the point where you can't have a high level of confidence about your dog's behavior when you get a dog of a certain breed. But the science definitely suggests that a dog breed influences behavior on some level. Like with people and all other animals, however, it is difficult to account for environmental influences which can make behaviors difficult to predict in individual cases. Peace out, cuboids. Today I'm going to give you a short book review of Road to Unfreedom. I highly recommend this thoughtful and well-written analysis of geopolitics and history focused on Russian attempts to influence the US and Europe. I thought the book is highly relevant to the current moment because Russian treatment of Ukraine is put into historical context and the 2014 invasion of Ukraine was extensively covered. This book was exactly what I wanted to understand more about present events. Having read it, I'll be honest, I'm kind of surprised more people were surprised by the recent invasion given Russia already invaded Ukraine in 2014 and lied about it and deceived people and killed people and so on. The road to unfreedom is also a cogent argument for the importance of history itself. For example, in 2014, the Russian government made it illegal to share basic facts about the Soviets collaborating with the Nazis in 1939. 
before fighting them in 1941. So trying to maintain a false history by reducing speech and thus thought itself. I had known things were bad in Russia, but I didn't realize how repressive the regime had become. Author Snyder, a historian at Yale, also highlights how the U.S. is drifting towards such a world, concerning indeed. Uh, some other useful and saddening insights are, for decades, Russia has blamed the gay or homosexual West for being a threat to the proper order of things. I was aware that, that criticizing the decadent West and whatnot, but there really is this um, undercurrent or overt uh, blaming of the gay people and the homosexual agenda and everything else. Another one is that Putin seems to have onboarded some very bizarre ideas of a sort of Christian world domination. And also uh, fascism as a concept that was linked to the West through Russian propaganda. So by definition, Russia could never be fascist. Well, isn't that an interesting way to see the world? Not only is The Road to Unfreedom a great work of scholarship, it is also very well written. So I'll end by sharing some of the excellent writing. This is a quote from Snyder in the prologue. Americans and Europeans were guided through the new century by a tale about the end of history, by what I will call the politics of inevitability, a sense that the future is just more of the present, that the laws of progress are known, that there are no alternatives, and therefore nothing really to be done. In the American capitalist version of the story, nature brought the market, which brought democracy, which brought happiness. In the European version, history brought the nation, which learned from war that peace was good, and hence chose integration and prosperity. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, communism had its own politics of inevitability. Nature permits technology, technology brings social change, social change causes revolution, revolution enacts utopia. Go check out that book. Until next time, think better to act better. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Oh, thanks. An article in the Columbia Daily...